Hello everybody, this is David. Welcome back to my channel. Well, this video is the next in our series, The Christian Ethic in the 21st Century, and we're currently looking at uh, a new system of ethics that's trying to supplant the Judeo-Christian ethic in our country and in our Western civilization. And we began to uh, look at the um, relationship between law and ethics and we ended the video the last video with the thought that there is a tension between law and morality and i want to have a look at that in this video so if you're ready let's have a look firstly there is the tension between freedom and law now here the situationists are very definite fletcher wrote nothing we do is truly moral unless we are free to do otherwise we must be free to decide what to do before any of our actions begin to be moral. No discipline but self-discipline has any moral significance. This applies to sex, politics or whatever else. A moral act is a free act done because we want to. And he wrote that in um, uh, Morality is Meaningless Apart from Freedom. Uh, page 136. Now on the face of it this is true but and it is a very big but who of us is in fact free? Our heredity, our environment, our upbringing, the traditions we have inherited, our temperament, the cu cum cumulative effect of our previous decisions all have an effect upon us. Now again, it is of the first importance that freedom does not only mean that a man is free to do a thing, it must also mean that he is free not to do it. And this is exactly where our past comes in. Most of us have made ourselves such that we are not free. The whole trouble about freedom is that for many of us, it's an illusion. Now, if a man really was free, then we might agree that he must be given an unrestricted choice. But in the human situation as it is, man as he is, cannot do without law to persuade and even compel him to do what is right. This is not to plead for a regime of law and it is not to reject a regime of freedom. For here we are certainly confronted not with an either or, but with a both and. Freedom and law go hand in hand. And it may be the truest proposition of all that it is by the influence of law that people come in the end to be really free. And to be fair, this is precisely where Fletcher falls down. For in the end, he writes, and I quote, In the language of classical biblical theology in the West, grace reinforces law, sometimes even bypasses it, but it does not abolish it, nor can it replace it, until sin itself is no more. Secondly, there is the tension between immorality and illegality. Now, we've already made the point that there are many things which are immoral, but which are not illegal. For instance, to take a crude example, prostitution is immoral, but it's not illegal. We have seen that the common, one might say, the orthodox view is that the law has nothing to do with private morals but only with public morality. Now, not everyone agrees with that. So prominent a jurist as Lord Devlin did not agree with the Wolfenden report. He said that it was wrong to talk of private morality at all. He holds that the suppression of vice is as much the law's business as the suppression of subversive activities. Now, there is no doubt that this is a very difficult doctrine, if for no other reason than it would 
then it would be hard for to get people to agree as to what a vice in fact is. Now, Fletcher quotes a section from the Sycamore Report from America, which says, and I quote, Let Christians face squarely the fact that what the body of authoritative Christian thought passed off as God's revealed truth was in fact human error with a Pauline flavour. Let us remember this fact every time we hear a solemn assertion about this or that being God's will or the Christian ethic. End of quote. So the difficulty would be to define, define vice. But what if we do not accept the Christian ethic as it is in the teaching of Jesus? Suppose we accept it ourselves and suppose that we are convinced that it is the best pres prescription for the life of society. Are we then quite happy if the law progressively makes what we think wrong easier? For example, are we quite happy about the legalising of consenting homosexuality, which is a huge issue in our day? Are we quite happy about the easing of divorce law? Again, um, it's a huge problem in our day. Would we be quite happy to find that it enacted or enabled um, unmarried students, for example, living together and, for example, if they had a child, would they become eligible for the same rights as married people? The trouble is that once a thing is not forbidden, it may be felt not only to be permitted, but to be encouraged. It could be argued that what the law permits, it approves. Now take the case of the, uh, for example, the university uh, student relationship. Um, no longer is the university in what we, what we call in loco parentis, that is, in the place of the parent. Um, but take especially the case of the residential universities. Now, it's argued that in their rooms, the students have the right to do as they want, to live their own lives, and that the university has no right to interfere with their private life. But what if that, if they make their rooms a centre of what some people would still call seduction, for example? What if they have, the boys have a different girl in bed with him every night, for example? What if they make their rooms a centre for experiment in taking drugs? Is the university supposed to be strictly neutral? Must the university stand by and see at least some students emerge from its life intellectually wiser but morally worse? Of course, we could say that if we no longer accept Christian standards, then those questions don't come up. It's... Um, um, it's here, in fact, that the public aspect of private mor morality comes in. A person can live their own life, but when they begin deliberately to alter the lives of others, then a real problem arises on which we cannot simply turn our backs and in which there is a place for the law as the encourager of morality. Okay, thirdly then, there is the tension between the individual and the community. This is the tension between individualism and solidarity. Now, in the early days of Judaism, there was such solidarity that the individual, as an individual, had hardly any independent existence. When Achan's sin was discovered, his whole family was stoned along with him, as we read in Joshua chapter 7. 
they say that to this day, if you ask a man in a pre primitive society what his name is, he will begin by telling you not his name, but his tribe. But in our time, it's the individual who is who is who comes to the forefront, who is um, maximised, as it were. Self-development, self-expression, self-realisation have become the watchwords of modern society. Too much law means the obliteration of the individual. Too much individualism means the weakening of the law. So it ha so happens that today we are living in a time of individualism. But a person will do well to remember that it can never be right to develop themselves at the expense of other people. So we may well come to the conclusion that one of the great problems of the present day is to adjust the delicate balance between freedom and law and between the individual and society. And the only solution is that a person should discover what it means to love his neighbour as himself. And it's only in the Judeo-Christian ethic can a person truly discover what it means to love another person as themselves because they have the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. So anyway, we've come to the end of this section of the new morality. As I said right at the beginning, new morality tries to beat or destroy the uh, Judeo-Christian ethic, but it cannot. There is no, there is nothing better than the Judeo-Christian ethic for building a person's life, for building a society, for building a nation, because it's it's based on the heart of God. God's heart is for humanity to get better, and unfortunately, mankind appears to be getting bitter. Um, because they don't want God, God's rules, but God's rules are the best. So I want to thank you for joining me in this series of videos and I'll see you on the next one. Bye bye.